it's the start of something, hopefully. Welcome to the Garibaldi Gazette, a podcast about Nottingham Forest. On this week's episode, a new home, question mark, refereeing decisions and reactions there too. Mark questions, Mark doesn't get answers because he's not allowed in. And a trip to the seaside to see the seagulls, question mark, exclamation mark, win, brackets, maybe. Chasing officials down tunnels since day one, this is the Garibaldi Gazette. What a week it's been in the world of Nottingham Forest Football Club. A gang, never a dull moment, etc. We're back to talk about the big news affecting the Reds in the last seven days. It's me, Matt Davis-Adams. I'm joined, as ever, by Asha Ali. Hi, Asha. Hello, everyone. Actually, just before I came on here, I was just reading um, a YouGov poll that we should probably put a link to, actually. Um, and they asked two over 2,000 referees. Now, this is like throughout world football now. They asked them which team they hated the most. <laughs> and unanimously, it was Nottingham Forest. So, you know, it's something to bear in mind. Mm, yeah, the conspiracy grows. Uh, Nick Miller, how are you doing? Have you come to terms with Saturday yet? Uh, it depends what element of Saturday you, you mean, really. Um, have I come to terms with uh, the club sending out a former referee to uh, speak to journalists in the mixed zone? Uh, not really. Uh, everything else, broadly speaking, yes. I sort of meant Mark Plattenberg disqualifying Betty from Jewel, which felt that harsh to me because I don't think she was not trying to be involved in the contest, but it's fine if defence is your first action when you're on a podium with a gladiator trying to knock you off. But anyway, we're not here just to bash Mark Plattenberg. We might do that later, but first of all, let's get into some news. And news broke last week that Forest could scrap stadium redevelopment plans and relocate due to a row with the City Council over rent. The city ground is sited on land leased from the City Council. There's only 33 years left on said lease. Uh, talks about an extension have stalled after the council, which is basically bankrupt, proposed that the current 250 grand a year rent is increased to about a million pounds, which I guess is one way to get yourself out of bankruptcy. Uh, Forest Chairman Tom Cartledge said, unless there is significant progress in negotiations between the club and the council, they could look elsewhere. The council says it remains committed to those further negotiations. Um, Nick, this feels like a bit of sabre rattling from the club. Don't make us angry. We might walk away. Do you think there's actually any substance to this? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the first instinct of this, isn't it? Because it was a very kind of, uh, well, all right, no one was mentioning this um, until you brought it up, lads. Um, it feels like a kind of very sort of weak orange squash version of the thing that American sports teams often do, which is to say, well, if you don't build us a new stadium, then we're going to move to, you know, Baltimore or something, which, and obviously Forest haven't quite got that mountain of leverage. In fact, they've got nowhere near that mountain of leverage. Um, and it's not the same thing. They're not asking the council to actually, you know, give us, you know, contribute money directly. Um, but yeah, it, it feels like, a bit of a sort of swing at trying to hurry things along, even though, I mean, if you're if you're the council, not kind of withstanding that they've got themselves in this mess, then you can you can understand why they're trying to squeeze the pips out of us. Um, but yeah, I mean, you would like to think, and this is just, I suppose, this is just sentiment talking as much as anything. You would like to think that it will all just a bit of a, a tactic to try and hurry things along a little bit because I don't think anyone really wants to leave City Ground. I think we talked about this last week or maybe the week before. Um, but I don't know. Is it, real, is it a realistic prospect? Are they really... It, 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 regardless of the kind of frustrations of how slowly this is going, is it... Do we really think the club is going to um, kind of go through with the absolute ball like that will that comes with kind of building a, a brand new stadium in a brand new place and you know doing all those all the things that come with that mm. 
Probably not, but Arsha, I do understand why they're annoyed with the council because it's pretty cheeky to drag your heels and say, well, how about a fourfold rent increase instead? Yeah, it is, but also, I mean, from Forrest, it's pretty basic, this, isn't it? It's basic politicking, and I would question the timing of it. Um, you know, to come out and sort of publicly lobby and, and put pressure on the council. Um, but at the end of all this, I know we're saying, well, you know, no one wants to move. No one wants to move. Um, but the, in this situation, like the council hold all the aces. Now the council, they're getting paid no matter what. Like if you go through the scenarios and there's only really three of them, like they'll either get a rent increase, maybe not fourfold, which is probably, you know, a bit much, but they'll definitely get something. And they kind of, you know, if you look at it as a Premier League team and whatever, then they're kind of, they will feel like they're in the right to kind of, you know, ask for a little bit more or whatever. So you either get that and they get paid or they, they'll they sell the land to someone else, you know, in that kind of doomsday scenario where they call the bluff and say, you know, fine, we're going to sell that land, they get paid again. Or, and this is the one that I can't see happening, I don't know how this one happens, they buy the freehold, which I like. So in all those scenarios, look, the council are getting paid, but... The, the freehold one is like, I feel like there's got to be some kind of real kind of Godfather-esque maneuvering to kind of get, do you know what I mean? Like, you got to make them an offer you can't refuse. Oh, that was good. Very you good. You know what I mean? Like, you know, yeah. we, we have a we have a sentimental weakness for the Sunny Ground Council. <laughs> I hope you can find it in your heart to, to give us the freehold. But I just, I just can't see that happening. I don't know. Like, I, where does, where do we go from here? But then, the, but then the, the the other thing in this as well is that both sides need to think about the rest of Nottingham here. You know, it's not just these two. You know, a power in a power game. If you move the city, you know, if we move the club from where they are, think about the ripple effect that will have. Obviously, they're probably not going to think about that. You know, because if you look at Nottingham, we we do have things like a massive hole where Broadmarsh have been. Or, you know, Nottingham Castle, that's a complete fiasco at the moment as well, you know. So both sides, there's probably stuff that they're both reneged on. I don't know. You know, there's probably things that they're both sort of blaming each other and 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 sort of posturing. And the council is on its arse and is trying to make a, a buck. But they need to think about the rest of Nottingham here. Mm, they sure do. And hopefully if they get some more money, they'll actually spend it on making the city centre center what it once was, because it's a bit of a derelict nothing land at the moment, and we want to stay at the city ground. So that's all we've got to say about that, really. On to other news. Announced on Instagram, naturally, our beautiful Brazilian Felipe is calling time on his forest and probably his football career too. He said he wanted to make the most of these last months in the best way possible with lots of joy, intensity, and dedication. Uh, Arsh, only five Premier League appearances for him this season, but oh boy, how pivotal he was last term. He was, and you know, he was sort of uh, as useful as the as the rest as the rest of those players, you know, who kind of regu regularly played and, and were the ones who actually ultimately kept us up. You know, this kind of misfit bunch that kind of came together, and, and Steve Cooper kind of got them uh, all singing from the same hymn sheet. Um, so he did. He he really did help us um, stay up, and and he scored one of the the greatest goals that never was, you know, against Southampton. I mean, that was beautiful. Like I I still remember that it's kind of like that diagonal ball to pluck that diagonal ball out of the air and just get it into a perfect position to to lift it over the goalkeeper, and the celebration that was insane. You just did not expect that kind of. Capoeira-esque levels of agility from, well, you kind of, I, I suppose you should probably, you know, if, you, if you're saying, you know, he's Brazilian. Um, but yeah, I mean, but then there was something kind of Samson-esque about him, I thought, at the end. Like when 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 he lost his hair, when he cut his hair off, he, he kind of felt like he wasn't the same player and he kind of lost his power a bit. So maybe that's a note to like all long-haired Premier League players, sudden, you know, who are currently enjoying success. Don't cut your hair. Yeah, why didn't we just shake Darwin Nunez in the changing rooms before <laughs> last week's games? That's what we're all left wondering. Uh, so, Felipe Augusto de Almeida Montero to his friends, Nick. I love his career path. Corinthians Porto, Atletico Madrid, 
Forrest. Um, I'm basing this off absolutely nothing, but but you wonder if he's actually been quite helpful for your, your Murillos and your Danilos, having having that older head around who can take them under their wing and speak in a language they can understand critically. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I wrote a piece about um, Murillo, like a sort of background piece um, for The Athletic, uh, not too long after he signed, I forget when it was, but I was speaking to someone who said that that is that is genuinely true that that the you know Felipe has taken particularly Murillo and to a sort of just like lesser extent um Danilo under his wing a little bit and you know I I, I don't know because it's, it's weird because Murillo came into the team and looked immediately like he needed no kind of mentoring whatsoever he just kind of slotted in I can't even remember who he would have been playing next to in his first games probably Willie Bolly um so and he looked so comfortable, so sort of freakishly comfortable straight away, that you 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 thought, well, he's actually not going to need the you know, calming influence of a fellow Brazilian next to him. But presumably, all that work was kind of done off the pitch and on the training ground. Um, but yeah, I mean, poor old Felipe. He's kind of, I believe, he barely trains these days. He's kind of like the Brazilian Paul McGrath. Um, is, well, I was going Ledley King. It's always a centre half, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. This kind of dust and farts in it, where his knees should be, <laughs> um, and you know he, he j- just about gets through ninety minutes every now and then, um, and dazzles us all with in various ways. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm very much going to miss the um, the sort of slight the, the the second of fear when he. You, you, he when he would he goes into those challenges and you, you can see coming from you know thirty minutes away, but for the for the most part seems they seem to come off. There was one um, that really it was in the West Ham game where he he um, completely missed one of those chances and really had to sort of bail him out, which was it was it, it, if you were to kind of confer far too much significance on individual moments and you know speaking as a, a, a journalist for athletic we, we wouldn't dream of doing that kind of thing but it felt it, it almost felt like he that, that was a would have been a moment where he go okay my 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 young my boy is is um is going to be okay to carry on without me now he can he doesn't need my guidance i uh, he, he's mopped up my mess so he can uh, go run free Marie, like run, run free um, but yes, I am going to miss those those moments of fear as he dived into a challenge that um, a less skillful defender would have just taken out someone's ankles, where he would more often than not come away with the ball and perhaps a chunk of ankle as well. Mm. All right. Well, look, let's enjoy him while we've still got him. Felipe going to leave at the end of the season next today. I'm afraid we've got to look back on Liverpool. Well, we've done well to avoid it up to this point, but sadly, we'll have to talk about the Liverpool incident. Paul Tierney, more like poor tears me. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't expecting that to get a laugh, I'll be honest with you. So, well, it was... Uh, uh, astonished. It, yeah, just... Uh, I don't know, it's like when you walk into a room and unexpectedly see someone naked, you just, whoa, OK. <laughs> your your first, first reaction is kind of slight embarrassment and laughter. <laughs> Fair. I mean, that's the coda for my career in a lot of ways. Uh, David Marples was melancholic upon exit from the world famous, but offered some positivity that you, me, Arsha and Nick need to hear. Ah, listener, what to do about that? I mean, well, I've just heard an interview with Ryan Yates telling the BBC and he kind of glossed over the shenanigans at the end of the game and he said it was their fault, they need to concentrate more, they can't do anything about it and, well, Ryan Yates is just the very best of us, isn't he? I mean, he put in a man of the match performance today, he was absolutely outstanding, as were all the players as well. Now, I'm not naturally an optimist. Some of you who know me will know this quite well, but hear me out, because as far as I see it, There's only so much injustice, so much uh, bile the abyss can spew out at us, can keep on spewing out at us. And sometime that well of, 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 of injustice and anger has to stop. And this must be the line. We didn't deserve that. We all know that. You know that. I know that. Um, We look a solid team. 
we look an improving team. We weren't hanging on. We gave as good as we got. We created chances. We looked a threat and we had Liverpool worried. Oh, but yeah, I know we've heard all this before. But I guess what we've got now is a real motivating factor to go and win games. We've got a real sort of sense of injustice and that can be a very powerful fuel. And that, dear listener, is what I'm going to cling to. I am currently pacing up and down outside a well-known supermarket. And I think I'm going to go in and buy a few things uh, that will help to prevent myself waking up in the cold sweat this evening, shouting swear words very, very loudly in my sleep. I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to go in and I'm going to buy some things which will help me to douse myself in beer and crisps and chocolate and pizza, maybe a cinnamon swirl, puppies and kittens. And I think that's the only thing I can do to help to help this feeling pass obviously listener alcohol is not the solution but sometimes you have to do what you've got to do i will see you on the other side after brighton well david in the words of homer simpson beer now there's a temporary solution easy on the cinnamon swirls though please uh right Arsha, the ref did us dirty. We've got to channel the rage and, you know, just try and use it in a positive way, right? And and we should also point out that Forrest missed some really good chances in this game. And I kind of wanted to criticise Anthony Alanga for missing them, but, you know, he's a sweet-looking kid. And also, <laughs> if he took chances like that every week, he'd still be playing for Man United and not Forrest. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure everybody's said everything about the referee situation and all that kind of stuff. And again, like, you know, we we spoke about this uh, a couple of weeks ago and whatever, and I had to quite an sort of uh, unsentimental view on this and, and it hasn't really changed. You know, I, I, I just don't feel like they're ever going to get it right, um, et cetera. Let's leave that. Um, but they did. They did play well. They played well for a, a massive chunk of that game, and they and they had they did have chances. Um, but what really sort of frustrated me was that we we sort of didn't play with a striker, which I found very odd. You know, because when you saw that uh, Divock Origi was on on the team sheet, you kind of thought, oh, okay. You know, I know we've seen a lot of him, and he's sort of he's hugging a quite a wide position. Um, which I, you know, I'm I'm not used to seeing him play playing that way, um, having seen him for AC Milan as well. So it it was odd that he was there and that we had Alanga through the middle. But then, you know, a couple of times it did work. You know, Alanga did have those chances. You know, he did manage to sort of. So as a ploy, it, it seemed like oh, okay, that was good. But I liked that he changed the dynamic when he brought Taiwo on because then I thought we looked uh, solid. You know, and and I guess I'm old school in that way. If you're going to have a striker and if you're going to play that kind of system, I don't know. You just need someone like Taiwo to come on, and he did change the game when he when he came on. Um, but you can't talk about this game without talking about what happened at the end. And I sort of am in the camp. Like I could, still, it's uh, it's like ridiculous that the that the ball wasn't returned to Forest. But aside from that, you know, we didn't take chances that we had. And after that situation, there was, there was about two minutes of play. And and we made almost every kind of mistake that you could defensively uh, in some aspects. None more so unforgivable than Taiwo not hoofing the ball. You know, like if, we, if we'd have hoofed the ball, it might have been a different situation. Whereas if you're telling me the drop ball, you know, led quite quickly to a to a goal then yeah but I don't know just that kind of period I watched it back and there was there was enough there was enough in between to kind of for Forrest to kind of really get a hold of the game again and I didn't like the time wasting either as well that was sort of employed a bit too quickly um but again look we don't want to be the victims I really don't like this and I, and it's not a good look as well having Maranakis on on the side of the pitch you know it's not Greece mate it really isn't like it's not a good look it re- you know what you're doing for the club in in a lot of aspects yeah you know great but you just what other owner would you see stood on the on the sideline after a game after a decision hasn't gone his way throughout english football well i mean at least he didn't punch the ref like that guy in turkey did a few uh, a few months ago did you see this uh, yeah 
Yeah. Uh, it, it, and I sort of, it, on a on a kind of logical and sensible level, I was also kind of, ah, oh, this isn't this doesn't look great, guys. Um, but I was also I was all, almost kind of. It's, it's one of those things that sort of felt has felt inevitable. Um, that he, you know he's going to you know follow the referee down the tunnel at some point, or or you know try and rip the referee's room door down or something like that. Um, it's, it, just, it just felt it was going to happen at some point. So it was kind of like, oh, okay, there he is. There's the guy we we thought we knew. You know, this is um, this is what we kind of expected from him. And it, yeah, obviously, sensibly, it's not a uh, it's not a great look to um, to have the owner down there. Although I did quite enjoy um, Stephen Reed getting sent off for saying, mm. I don't know what he could have said to, to the referee. Who knows? But yeah. I also enjoyed the um, the idea of uh, you know as you said, Arsha, quite a bit of time passed between or yeah, a couple of minutes, which is you know in the context of the injury time in a football game is quite a lot of time passed between the what should have been Forest having the ball and the uh, and the Liverpool goal. Um, I quite enjoyed the idea of like Forest fans cult- contemplating things like the multi universe theory, where you know the the the, where one thing happens uh, and the you know decision is made and the world the universe then splits into two realities where in one Forest get the ball and hey maybe cross and score ourselves or win a corner or something and in the other reality what happened happened so um, I'm sure that prob- prob- well I don't know whether it was at the forefront of uh, the uh, frustrations um, but I enjoyed it nonetheless I did also ha- having. I'm also going to go back on something I said last week, which was to say that I find complaining about refereeing decisions and whatnot incredibly boring. Um, obviously, we can. This is this is because 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 this was. It's not like a well. I thought that might have been a foul or whatever. And most um, refereeing decisions are kind of object open to interpretation. They're not objective facts. This was just an objective thing that he got wrong. So I can understand very much being. Um, annoyed like that, and I also did see quite a few people saying, "Well, you know, don't you, you can't don't get annoyed about the referee decision. Get annoyed about, as you say, Tyro not hoofing the ball out, or, or Hudson Odoi had a chance. I think it was Hudson Odoi had a chance to clear it as well. But you can be angry about the two things at the same time. You can be angry about getting done over by uh, an inexplicable referee decision, and you can be annoyed at Forrest's. And I know it wasn't technically it wasn't a a um, a set piece. It's kind of originated from a set piece, but it was a the, the goal actually wasn't it was kind of from open play. But you, you, you be annoyed at failure to hoof the ball out. Be annoyed at an, another inability to you know defend properly from across. Um, you know we it's duality, man. We will, we we, uh, we can be uh, we can be annoyed about separate things at the same time. But we're mm. numb though. That's the thing. We've become numb to both things. We've become numb to all the you know the, the decisions that we don't get but we've also in that way we've kind of become numb or not sort of engaging with how defensively poor we can be as well like we're just sort of glossing over that which is a shame it's interesting isn't it i'm sorry matt uh, you you um your job is to kind of wrangle us a little bit and we're just kind of chatting away here but it's interesting that like i i think probably if you were to ask most forest fans who the at this point who the player of the year is then Murillo would be would probably I don't know, would certainly be up there and yet he is playing in the position at, uh, which seems to be the sort of the heart of our biggest weakness um, whether it's you know whether we are kind of overrating him slightly whether he is just sort of dazzling us with his you know assurance on the ball and some of those last minute tackles and the fact that he's so young and so inexperienced or whether it is just something that isn't to do with him whether it's because he hasn't really had a consistent partner next to him for uh, for all of the time there. Or maybe it's another sort of structural thing with the defense. I'm not very very tactically minded, so I'd appreciate if some you know if someone could, um, uh, uh, someone who is more sort of tactic te- technically and tactically minded could you know break down why we are conceding all these goals and what whether there is a common mistake being made and, and whether it is just kind of Murillo's inexperience and his some of his defensive weaknesses that we're not kind of recognizing quite so much it's interesting sounds like you've just pitched yourself a piece <laughs> for <laughs> tactical I've, I've pitched i've pitched a piece to someone else who uh, is cleverer than me 
<laughs> right, fair enough. I'm just looking down at who else could be player of the year, and it's um sort of tricky, although I'm surprised that Anthony Alanga has got five goals and seven assists, which is a pretty good return. Mm. Uh, Murillo's up there, though. Can, can I just tell you what my Murillo chant would be that I'm really disappointed hasn't taken off yet? Sure. It's obviously when he signed, it was all about, is this the way to our Murillo? And it's obviously got to be to that. But I think we're passing what is a really good opportunity here to get three players into one chant. It would go like this. Is this the way to our Murillo? Every night I've been hugging Danilo. Dreaming dreams of our Murillo. And our knee who waits for me. Nice. Yes. It's chanceable, so, isn't it? It's great. I'm so disappointed that there isn't really any kind of chant from Murillo. It's like everybody bottles it. Mm. Like, <laughs> I can't say that I've been in, you know, the stands that much and uh, been trying to get it going or anything. But there just doesn't seem to be anything. It's like we all came out with, oh, yeah, we can do, you know, the, is this the way and all that, whatever. And no one's done it. No, you <laughs> no could just go ole, 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 Murillo, lo, lo, if you want to, you know, options. Um, Something, just sing his name. Mr. Marples, that's your challenge for Brighton on Sunday. Get that challenge, please. I suppose, I suppose that the only one is you'll never beat Murillo has, has got a bit of a, an outing, a bit, which is, yeah. you know, yeah. which is, uh, it's it's nice because it's kind of continuing a kind of lineage, isn't it? Mm, but, um, but also a bit uh, sort of... Uh, a precursor, because the, the last time I heard that was uh, you'll never beat McKenna, and then he yeah. won player of the season. So, there you go. Yeah. All right. It all makes sense. Good. Okay. We'll have a look at Brighton in a moment. First, though, we have a charity partner who you can donate to if you're able. They're called Hope Nottingham. They offer a food bank service for those in need in knots. Here's Nigel Adams from the charity to tell us more. Hope Nottingham runs a network of 14 community hubs and food banks across the Nottingham area, everywhere from Stapleford across to Netherfield. In the last year, we've given out 25,000 food parcels for people that are struggling with all kinds of difficulty uh, due to cost of living, due to um, unemployment, due to homelessness, all sorts of different issues. But we're only able to do that because we get massive, wonderful support from so many people. Uh, and Nottingham Forest, actually, in recent years, have been really helpful to us. We've done a number of food bank collections at the ground through Nottingham Forest, and the m massive support that we get across the city, we're able to bring hope to hundreds of people. And we will provide a link to that in the show notes too. If you'd like to donate, it is localgiving.org slash hopenotstgg. That's localgiving.org slash hopenotstgg. Check out the show notes uh, to find the link too. All right, Brighton Preview comes next. So Forest go to the Amex on Sunday to take on Brighton and Hove Albion. Mustn't forget the Hove. People always do that. Um, Nick, you were talking about defence. One clean sheet in the last 16 Premier League games, and yet nobody's thrashing Forest. They're usually losing by the odd goal if they are losing. Are we ever going to get any of these AFCON players back? And if so, does Willy Bolly go straight back into said defence to stiffen it up a bit? Yeah, I think so. If if we are assuming that Felipe is going to play like one one game in three for the rest of the season, then it probably has to be Bolly to come back in when he when he is able. Um, I don't know. I, it, it's it's weird because uh, I think we did we may have discussed this last week as as well. But Ina, well, during Afcon, you thought, oh, I wish we had Ina back. We, we we could really do with him in the team. But Nico Williams has been really good in the, the last few weeks, so you wouldn't think that Arnie would come back in for him. I, I'm slightly uncomfortable with him playing. He, he does a reasonable job at left-back, but um, he's not left-footed. Um, always slightly comfortable with him playing there. I suppose, um, you know, as you said, Bolly should probably come back in. Sangare, I think he was on the bench at, at the weekend. Would he come in for... I don't know. Dominguez was. We're not. Uh, we probably don't know at this point whether Dominguez is kind of injured for the Brighton game. But if he's not there, do we bring Sangari in? I don't know. It's just. It's a strange one. We're having been without these players for the best part of two months now. It's a little bit difficult to see where at least two of them kind of or or who two of them would would come back in for. I suppose. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It, 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 we're kind of working on theory at the moment because, but again, we've discussed this before. But Sangari is hasn't been anywhere near as good, to say the least, as we kind of hoped he would be. But then again, he hasn't really played in the position that uh, he was, you know, impressive in uh, for 
uh, PSV uh, in and in the system that uh, that Nuno has kind of generally played, you would think that he would fit in that quite nicely. He would he would be the sort of deeper one next to Dominguez or Yates or or Dino. Um So you'd like I, I, you would like to to see him at least tried there for a few games. Whether Brighton's the right game to to try that, I don't know. Although you know, as we we may discuss that it's probably a pretty decent time to play Brighton. So maybe you do try it. Yeah, I'm feeling super optimistic, Arsha, for some reason about this game, even though I've just looked at Brighton's home league record and they've only lost one game at the Amex so far, and that was back in August. But this match comes smack dab in the middle of their Europa League game against Roma. So they've got the first leg in Italy on Thursday night, and uh, then the return comes after Sunday's game. They haven't won any of their last three domestically. Mitoma, Joao Pedro, March, Hinshelwood and Milner are injured. Gilmore suspended. As Nick alludes to, if you want to play Brighton, this is the time to do it, right? Yeah, but I think, can I just first get my my complete loving out of the way of Roberto De Zerbi? Mm. Man, I just, I absolutely love that guy. Not for the, not least for the fact that he kind of reminds me of Paddy Considine. <laughs> you know, the actor Paddy Considine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You won't be able to unsee that now. Um but he like yes, everybody actually, said yeah, this. He does. He, yeah, he does. Really. That's all I thought about, for, thought about that for a second. If you gave, yeah. if you gave Paddy Considine the hair of like a, a metal band bass player from sort of the mid two thousands, that's him. That's great. That's I've exactly that before. That's there all I've ever seen. Like from the Sassuolo days, I've always gone, "What the hell is Paddy Considine doing there?" Um, everybody said all this. Look, man, there's millions of articles that are written about how exciting he is, what a visionary football manager he is. But he is. He, he actually genuinely is. He's the most like exciting football manager. If you're into any of that kind of stuff and you're into, you know, seeing who the kind of, not, not in a hipster way, but just seeing who's actually moving the game on a bit, he's definitely one of those people, you know. And again, this is not bandwagon stuff. Like, I, I watch, I've said this so many times, like, but I watch a lot of Serie A. And it's, my, it's my thing. It's the league aside from the English leagues, is, is the only other one I watch. And so it was no surprise to see how well he was doing, you know, because you saw him doing that with Sassuolo. They were at, he was, they were regularly, like, ruining big teams' seasons, you know, because they would just rock up there and just, like, blow them away with this kind of balls-out football, you know, which either goes spectacularly well or just spectacularly bad. And And we're kind of seeing some of that. But it's just the little things as well. Like I love the kind of, I love how infuriated everyone gets when Lewis Dunk puts his soul on top of the ball. You know that kind of new thing where you know the, where they control the ball with the sole of their foot and they stand there still. I think that is bloody genius. You see it and it works every single time. The fans will go, the fans will get upset, which the players think, oh no, I better do something here. They they go for a press and then they just get picked apart. You know, the pass goes through, you know, the ball goes through the lines, and then they've got the the sort of space that you would expect them to have on a counter-attack. It's 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 brilliant stuff. If you can if you can in any way take yourself out as a forest man, not in this game. But like, if you can watch a team, if you enjoy football in that way, you should watch them because it is just beautiful to watch. But anyway, I hope we beat them. I hate them, um, and I hope we. Yeah, get I was, hang on, hang on a minute. I was feeling quite. Matt has sort of edged me towards optimism with this, and now, and now we're now apparently we're playing IX ninety five, and I've, I've, I've um, all the the hope as. No, no, no. This is going to be the spectacular bad end of the spectrum. They're going to, they're going to get right, it. Okay, fine. Yeah, you know, like they did last season. They still turned up last season and, and we beat them, you know, because they were trying to play that kind of thing and, you know, it didn't quite work or whatever. So, so let's see. Let's see. Mm. Forrest took four points off Brighton last season. You do feel like there might be uh, a bit of a bromance between Evangelos Marinakis and Roberto De Zerbi. This is De Zerbi in November of last year. I'm honest and clear. I don't like 80% of English referees. That isn't a new opinion. I don't like them. I don't like their behaviour on the pitch. And you have to say that's fair enough. Uh, it is a two o'clock kickoff down on the South Coast this weekend. Let's hope that Forrest can get a result that they desperately need. All right, we're nearly done for today, but we're going to finish with the most important part of the pod. It's called the end bit. And in light of the Felipe news, this is something that Nick suggested, and boy, has it been hard work, trying to think of the most attractive Forest players 
ever. Had we gone the other way, which would have been extremely cruel, uh, we could have been here all day. But Nick, you say that you've got plenty of front runners here. Obviously, Felipe's number one. That's that's undisputed, right? Yeah, I think that's that, that, that's fair enough. I, I, I've got I've got a few candidates. Um, I think of the the, the of the rest, uh, Felipe side of the rest of the current squad. Tyro's quite a good looking lad. Mm. He's got quite a nice smile. You know, maybe I'm just influenced by the fact that uh, I love him in many other ways. But uh, you know, that, that's relatively slim pickings elsewhere, unfortunately. Um, who else have I got? Uh, Henri Lansbury is a key, kind of classic. Mm, I got you him. Know, yeah. You, you sort of classic all ball one pretty boy. You know, he's he's wearing spray on jeans and a weird t shirt, but you know. Um Gareth Williams. I've got him too. Yeah. 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 There you go. Um Chris Fairclough going back a little bit more. Can't quite sort of baby faced, but you know. Yeah. Mm. Arsh is not convinced by any of this at all. <laughs> I've got a couple I've got a couple more though. Um I remember I, it's not quite the same thing, but I uh, I can always remember my aunt lusting after Viv Anderson's legs, um, which is you know per, very perfectly understandable. Um, T, Steve Chettle, right? He always oh yeah, younger yeah. Steve Chettle. So uh, he 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 always struck me as a sort of um, you know he was your mate's dad uh, or uh, and you know the mums fancied him at the at the kind of school gate kind of thing. Um, and then managers Philip Montagnier. He, you know, you can you can imagine having a, a, a romantic meal in a nice restaurant with him. He he picks a nice wine or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I, I felt like I was winning Arsha over in the the, the last some of those last few uh, selection. Yeah, yeah, towards the end, I, yeah. I was with you there, Montagnier. Yeah. Definitely. Have you got any other names, Arsha? Um. No, I mean, <laughs> we're just not a very good looking team and historically never have been. Although I will say when I used to have my season ticket in the uh, lower Brian Clough, I remember uh, a woman uh, remarking on Jack Lester. Yeah. She really fancied Jack Lester. Um, so Swarthy, they, yeah. yeah. What about Chris Cohen? Yeah, I got Chris Cohen. And I'm, Chris I'm Cohen staggered love. that Nick didn't say that because he absolutely loves Chris Cohen. And, and yeah, having having been... Mm, I don't know, two feet away from him this summer. Uh, I can confirm that he is quite a handsome chap. What he also, uh, uh, having kind of, so, sorry, to, we, we, we've mentioned Chris Cohen, so we're, we're, we're losing <laughs> the next five minutes. Uh, I interviewed him um, quite a while ago now, actually. I think it was after probably his third uh, knee injury. He lost track. Um, but he, I can confirm, he smells incredible as well. Um, and it, I didn't, it wasn't like I got uncomfortably close and like sniffed him. It was just, you know, I was in a, I was in a room with him. That's, that's a very pleasant scent. Oh, it's Chris Cohen. Mm. Um, but yeah, maybe I, I, I don't, I don't know Chris Cohen, but I, I, I've, I've spoken to him a few times and messaged him occasionally about a few things. So I am now slightly more uncomfortable revealing too much on the very, very, very slim chance that, you know, he would hear this and, you know, never respond to me ever again. I think he's a listener. I would, I would definitely have Chris Cohen as, as I hope a, so. a listener of the Garibaldi Gazette. Uh, can we have a shout out for Jamal Abdoon's beard? Just his beard, yeah. not the rest of him. Just that yeah. was a great beard. And right. also, uh, it, you know, could have been the name of this podcast. Jamal Abdoon's beard, yeah. One of the ones that slipped away. There are a couple of others that I'd like to put in. I can't believe nobody's mentioned Ryan Yates because he's got that kind of clean-cut, all-American look. Square yeah. jaw. Yeah. yeah, which some people would go for. Lewis McGugan, <laughs> relatively attractive man. Robert Rosario, not without his charm. Uh, on managers, I remember Chris Hutton's last game. I was stood, I was sat in the Peter Taylor stand directly behind the home dugout. I remember thinking, how can a man with such firm and proud buttocks oversee <laughs> such a meek mild football team um, but he was good looking for his age too and certainly kept himself in good nick I feel like we should stop talking pretty quickly now although I have just made a mental note of sweetest smelling footballers as a potential 
end it for the future um that is going to do us for today's show though you can follow us on x at the garibaldi g it's the garibaldi gazette on instagram and you can watch the pod on youtube as well if you like give us a, a like and subscribe there we're also the garibaldi gazette if you listen via the traditional formats and you want to leave us a nice review on apple Podcasts, spotify or wherever you get your pods that'll help us and help other forest fans find the show too we'll be back with another one next week until then thanks to david for his contributions asha and nick and lucy for putting it all together we'll speak to you soon bye for now